begin the webinar. We are delighted to have with us today Chris Baird for our Healthcare Innovation Trends from the Trenches. This webinar series we created uh, about a year ago when there are about 10 rehearsed and, and well-recorded ones on YouTube that you can find on our website as well as on, on YouTube. It's all about what we see happening in the field. I'm Andy Simon, and I'm a corporate anthropologist, president of Simon Associates Management Consultants. We specialize in working with organizations that need or want to change. Chris Baird, I'm going to tell you about in a little while, but Chris is an expert in the whole area of mystery shopping and helping organizations see themselves with clear eyes and in better ways. So I'm delighted that she can join us, and I'm anxious to get us all set up today. Why this webinar series? The webinar series I started because as an anthropologist, we were watching things happening in the field that we just couldn't quite understand how to communicate to others. And we wanted to figure out a way to do them that was easily shareable so that what you learned you could share as well. This became sort of fun because we kept finding experts who were just delighted to share with us what they were seeing. And it became quite an interesting conversation among many of the folks who were doing much of the same things we were. I often start with this. The real voyage of discovery consists not in seeking new landscapes, but in having new eyes. And I share that with you because we know that when the brain has its perceptual map formed, it's very difficult for it to see with new eyes. And so we go about the daily habits in a very comfortable way, unclear how we can proceed to see things as they are changing. Aness Need, the diarist, has a wonderful quote. We don't see things as uh, they are. We see things as we are. And when Chris talks to you a little bit later, she'll be telling you about how we can't even see what's right in front of our noses. And when we see them, we don't act on them either. And I can't say this is personal. This is about how the brain is very selective. Once you have a perceptual mind map operating, it really deflects what it sees so that it can only see what it wishes to. The setup for today came about because we started to do our own field work as anthropologists working with our clients on, on what was happening with their own experience. Some of the research we were doing for one healthcare center was we tested all of the telephone answering systems in about 25 hospitals in the Northeast. We were very interested to hear what the first impression was that customers had when, in fact, they were calling an organization to see what was actually happening. What we found was very disturbing. In one case, it took 10 rings before the phone was answered. The story we set up was that we had a friend who had been diagnosed with lung cancer, and we were interested in knowing more about their program or the options. In another, we said our father had been diagnosed with prostate cancer, and we were doing research for them. And so it became quite interesting to see that virtually none of the hospitals, even the, those that specialized in cancer, had operators that could really welcome us and were empathetic and could help us find the right solutions. In many cases, they sent us to another switchboard. Cancer Centers of America, on the other hand, really understood what it was like to have somebody you loved with cancer. And they were empathetic from the first point and kept going right from there. Now, Innovation games that we played with patients taught us other things. They said that mm, they had lost faith and trust in the physicians. They weren't sure if they were being asked to take an x-ray or a lab test because it was good for the doctor or good for them. They weren't sure where to turn, and many of them had started using CVS and Walgreens, these mini clinics, because it was fast, simple, and $85. Some of them were very uncomfortable with urgy center solutions. They call them the two Tylenols go to your primary care doctor solution, not giving them much care at all, and very concerned about costs. And the $5,000 deductibles or $2,000 deductibles, they weren't sure what's going on. The loss of faith and so forth were very concerning. Now, as an anthropologist, we do a lot of observational research. In one hospital, we watched patients wander around looking for someone to guide them, whether it was pre-admission testing, x-ray admissions, whether you had wayfinding or you didn't. 
um, everyone felt very alone. In another situation, we watched a bunch of residents walk right past an elderly patient around them without any concern at all of whether or not they were cared for or getting care that they needed. And it was very unlike the culture of the place that they were working through. Let me introduce Chris. Chris speaks the language of someone who's been there and done it. She is a registered nurse. She's had extensive experience inside hospitals and healthcare institutions. She led an award-winning service excellence initiative, chronicling in her best-selling books. I put two of her three books up here, and she's also writing some white papers that will be available to you. Her books are excellent. In 1991, Chris launched her company, The Baird Group. And in this capacity, she had developed a very unique approach for mystery shopping. And when she does it, she actually becomes a patient or an advocate or a loved one for a patient, or she shadows physicians around to actually watch them. And she'll tell you more about actually how she does this, but it is very innovative and it adds tremendous value and credibility. In 2009, she was appointed to serve as an advisor for the National Service Corps. So, as Andy said, my background is in consulting with the emphasis on patient experience. And it's been a great journey. And what the way we got into mystery shopping 20 years ago or so was as I was consulting, I started to realize people would not accept the data at face value and, and see their patient satisfaction and they'd want to shoot holes in it. And I started to work with qualitative research to help bring the stories to life with focus groups, with in-depth interviews, and then with mystery shopping. And we had clients ask us for more and more, can you do 300 calls? Can you do, you know, 18, 20 patient visits? So we started to do all of that. And, you know, what we realized is that it's really all about the patient experience. I mean, when you try to engage the heart, of your staff members, if they're only looking at data, they're not getting the stories. And so the stories help get at um, that heart piece of it. And so we started doing more and more mystery shopping and found that, that people would be more engaged when they heard the stories. And so I like the definition of the patient experience from the Barrel Institute. It's the sum of all interactions shaped by the organization's culture that influences patient perceptions across the continuum of care. Let me dissect that just a tad before we get into the meat of the program. You know, I want to emphasize that interactions aren't just between people. It's not person to person. It's not patient to doctor, patient to nurse, nurse to doctor. It's not just the people interactions. It's how human beings also interact with their environment and technology. So let's keep that in mind as I'm talking about mystery shopping the patient experience. Also culture. Culture is probably the most important word in this definition because really it's how we do things around here. That's what culture is. And there's a big impact of culture in the patient experience. It influences who we recognize, what we tolerate, what we celebrate, what we talk about in an organization, and what we value. So when we talk about the patient experience, it all comes down to trust. And everything about the patient encounter needs to instill trust. If it's not instilling trust, it might just as well be diminishing trust. And it takes us split seconds to form a first impression about a person or an organization and it's very easy to lose a patient's trust. So remember healthcare is a service industry and everything about it should wrap around the service experience. You know marketers can pull new patients into a business but it's the experience and and what they're going to talk about that keeps them coming back. And throughout my career, I have used the following diagram 
to show people the connection between the patient experience and business development. So if we walk up from the bottom to the top here, name recognition, top of the mind awareness, preference, use, reuse, positive word of mouth. If you look at the bottom four bullets, that's where traditional marketing and PR can influence somebody. It'll bring them in the door. It'll help them form an opinion in advance, they'll, they'll have an idea about you, but it's when you use a product or service that you're deciding, are you going to come back? And will you speak positively or will you recommend to others? So that's the ladder of marketing achievement. And as you can see, it's the top couple boxes that are going to be service-centered organization are really going to focus on those two things or those three things because when they use your service, Will they reuse it? Will they come back? And that's really a strong link between marketing and business development. When a person comes in contact with your organization, they have many, many moments of truth. And a moment of truth is defined as the moment your patient decides if you are what you say you are. So there are many ways you describe your business. And a lot of the, the things that present as a promise, are you what you say you are, are things like your mission, your vision, your values, and even your tagline in your advertising. And the reason I bring this up is that there is, you know, if anybody goes on your website, chances are very good they're going to be able to pull up your mission, your vision, your values. If they see any of your advertising, they're going to see a tagline. And a tagline and all of the mission, vision, values are really part of the promise, the promise that you make. And chances are good, every one of you out there listening has a, a mission, vision, value statement that includes words like quality and excellence. They may even include patient-centered, patient-driven, compassion. But remember that quality is in the eye of the beholder. And even though in healthcare we are measuring clinical quality, the consumer expects you to deliver clinical quality. After all, delivering safe, qualified medical care is the reason why you're in business as a hospital or as a clinic or as a doctor. You, you, there's an expectation out there. So quality is in the eye of the beholder. And where are they judging quality? Well. It's during the moments of truth. And when do they occur? Well, let me summarize it very simply in, in that it's first impressions, last impressions, and everything in between. In other words, they are continuous from the first symptom when the patient is deciding, I don't feel well, I need help. And they reach out and they pick up the phone and they call. You know, it, and, and it follows not only from that first touch point, of looking up your phone number, but it carries through the entire experience. So there are um, several types of mystery shopping that I'm going to talk about. Phones, walkthroughs, patient visits, paired patient visits, and care partner observations, which is part of ethnography. So let's look at some of these methods that we use in mystery shopping. The first example I want to give you is from a large academic medical center who asked us to assess what was going on. They were constantly getting complaints about the phone experience. And when we did an assessment of hundreds of calls to their organization over a six week period, it, w it came up as a distribution like this. Every time we do a, a mystery call, at the end, after they've ranked things like the greeting, the closure, the friendliness, the, the sincerity, the empathy, um, knowledge, ability to ask appropriate questions, they rank all those things. But then we always ask the question, based on this call, how likely are you to seek future care at this organization? And you can see, if you just go to the bottom, the very unlikely and somewhat unlikely, we had 46% in this particular study that said they were unlikely to ever want to call or seek future care at this organization based on their phone call. So as Andy mentioned in her experiences, those phone calls are absolutely critical. The phones are the front door and for this organization it was pretty negative. So I went back to the manager of this switchboard and I talked to her and I said, tell me about 
how you communicate your goals to your switchboard staff and the people that you train on the phones. And she said, our goal is to get rid of the caller in 15 seconds or less. And so in that situation, I said, well, congratulations, you are achieving your goal. However, let's look at possibly setting a new goal, such as one call does it all. In other words, really helping that caller. So they were, it was like the hot potato syndrome. A call would come in and since they were being measured on getting rid of the caller in 15 seconds or less, they were doing just that. They were passing it off as quickly as they could even if it was landing in the wrong destination. So then let's move on to talk about walkthroughs. You know, there are so many times people are coming in contact with your organization, not as a patient, but as a visitor, if it's an inpatient setting, or like me, I'm constantly accompanying my mother to various appointments, my sister to various appointments, my husband, and so what I can do as a visitor is I'm, I'm constantly watching things like staff interactions, wayfinding, cleanliness, the waiting room experience. I can tell a lot about privacy. So as we're mystery shopping, I advise you, too, to spend time in your waiting rooms and ask yourself, what, what do you observe about staff interactions? What do you observe about the condition of that waiting room? Cleanliness walk into the bathrooms that are closest to the lobby, walk into the bathrooms that are closest to the cafeteria, experience what a, a visitor would experience. We have privacy up here too because there are so many times that we will be Mr. Shopping and sitting in a waiting room and we can overhear things that we really shouldn't be overhearing. And I put up there one of the examples that, that um, I observed when I was mystery shopping one day in a medical practice. Um, the staff was talking to each other and one said to the other, I wouldn't bring my dog to him. Well, that could have really been a conversation about their vet, but we were in a doctor's office and I looked at the expressions of the people sitting next to me and it was very disconcerting to them because they thought they were talking about the surgeon. One of the other things I really like to do is we take pictures anytime we're on site. Well, this is a nasty photograph and I apologize, but this was in an emergency department at about two o'clock on a Sunday afternoon. The whole place was filthy and upon entering the bathroom, this is what the mystery shopper saw. First impression, not so good. Then I, I could be a connoisseur of healthcare signage for the rest of my career. Just because you can tell a lot about a culture by the types of signs they put up. Day surgery patient loading and unloading. I load and unload boxes. I load and unload skids on the back of a semi, but I don't like the term loading and unloading of patients so much. Then there's this one. If you have a question about a loved one in surgery, please call 5222, but there's no phone. Again, what does that say? Not much attention to detail. And this last sign, this was in a pediatric department, and you can see where it's located just above the button for the elevator, and it says, this elevator eats little fingers. Parents, please watch your children. So a sign like that sends a message that somebody's not really thinking. And I always think about if you have a precocious little reader in a pediatric department that just saw that, that child may turn into a psych referral because you freaked him out so much about this sign. <laughs> so let's go on to patient visits. Appointment access, wayfinding, registration and reception, courtesy. These are all moments of truth that we can assess during patient visits. Efficiency engagement. Engagement with the doctor, engagement with the nurse. Were they empathetic? Did they show respect? So information, how information was imparted about condition or a treatment. And we recommend that they be non-emergent situations. I know that there are some companies out there that actually send mystery shoppers in feigning a heart attack or something like that. that. We feel that that's unethical. It needs to be non-life and limb threatening in an urgent manner if it's in an urgent care center. 
something like a strep throat or you know a sprained muscle, something like that. But patient visits, you know, are in, incredibly valuable in helping you to see the the actual step-by-step -step experience that a patient goes through. Because you stop and think about something as simple as seemingly simple as wayfinding can be a frustration that sets a person off before they've even arrived for their appointment. Then they walk in and let's say at registration there's nobody at the desk. Or even worse, there's somebody at the desk but they're on their cell phone texting. You know, are they courteous? Do they look up? Do they make eye contact? And the next one is paired patient visits. This again is somebody, it, it's sort of like shadowing but it allows direct observation, but it's combined with a you know patient interview. So somebody is going along with a patient that has a schedule or scheduled appointment. And they're not only doing direct observation, but they're also asking the patient for their perceptions. So they might say, okay, the doctor was just in here. What did you think of that? Okay, we're in the waiting room. Tell me what you're thinking about the waiting room you know, wait times, things like that, where the, the actual patient will be able to say, well, I would have thought that they would have had me in 10 minutes ago. So things like that. And it's ideal for specialty areas like cardiac surgery, oncology, pediatrics. Those are areas where we find this, this approach to be very useful. So the next method is with the care partner observer. And this by far is my favorite because it it helps you bring the patient experience assessment inpatient and sometimes that can be really tricky. But we've developed a methodology that helps us pair up with somebody either with a scheduled admission or somebody who's being admitted through the emergency department. So it lets us observe then handoffs, patient engagement tactics, you know, the whether or not they, the environment is quiet, anything from HCAPs we can actually observe ourselves. The patients often offer their observations and we also ask them questions. So we get the patient perception at the time of the event. So we're not, there's not that time lag between the admission and the discharge and when the survey either arrives or the call comes in. So one of the examples I wanted to share with you was a story from a patient that really felt uneasy in her bathroom. And you can see the picture on the left. There was a ceiling tile missing. And that ceiling tile missing, you know, the person was to stand in her shower and she's like, my gosh, I don't know who or what could be above me. That makes me very uncomfortable. And then the picture on the right was just kind of a grimy looking area of this particular patient bathroom. The next one was from a client whose cleanliness scores were really suffering. And when we looked around, EVS was doing a really good job. I mean, floors were clean, trash had been emptied, things like that. But what we noticed was a lot of bad habits from staff. Now, looking at just the quantitative survey scores with, with cleanliness, cleanliness being poor, we would have missed the fact that staff would do things like throw this gown on the floor and it would stay there for two full shifts. And the next slide shows too another staff habit that we picked up on where they would just keep pushing things down on the bedside table. As, some, as the patient finished the tray or something, they would take the unconsumed juices and set them there or the half consumed drinks and set them there and then every time a new tray would arrive they just push everything down and so the patient's description was this place is a mess and really you stop and think it, it was hard for the staff to recognize that you know this bedside table is his environment it's the thing that, you know, is indicating to him the cleanliness of the whole place. So it's important for them to take ownership of managing the clutter. So the next slide is just a quick quote, and that is, you know, as we are doing care partner observations, we'll ask the patient, um, the nurse was just in here, what did you think of that encounter? 
And we get so much good information from that. So the patient will turn to us and say, well, I was just scammed like a loaf of bread. There was one organization that they had mandated hourly rounds and they used the wristband scanners to document that that rounding indeed took place. Well, what it documented was that the wrist had been scanned, not that they had actually completed care rounds. We observed that there was no interaction with the patient at all. They just simply came in, scanned the band, and went out. The patient's perception was that she had been scanned like a loaf of bread. Then another gentleman talked about, I'm just the thing, I'm the blob at the end of the of the tubes and another one said I couldn't understand a thing that nurse was saying so that gave us some really good insight but another story that I wanted to share with you that really is behind this quote it's a lady who was just admitted and the nurse wrote nothing by mouth up on the whiteboard the patient was being prepared for emergency surgery in comes little Elizabeth with the dinner tray and she sets it down in front of the patient and writes her name up on the board and says, if you need anything, just let me know. She puts her name right next to where it says nothing by mouth and leaves the room. And the daughter of the patient turned to my mystery shopper and said, this is why I can never leave. The left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. As I said in the beginning, you know, it's all about trust. And when something like that happens, where it says nothing by mouth and then a minute later a staff member delivers a tray, it doesn't do much to instill patient trust. So there are some pros and cons to mystery shopping. The pros include that you do have an objective observer who's coming in without a bias. A lot of places like to have their own staff do the mystery shopping to save money and and that's fine but do know that you come in with a bias and so you may know why things operate the way they do and so you tend to be a little bit more accepting with an outside person you get thorough documentation you get the stories to help resonate with the heart and then it helps you identify your star performers and best practices those are important things but of course with the pros come cons and a couple of the cons in mystery shopping is that, you know, to do it with an outside vendor does require a financial investment. But I want to also point out that not everybody is a good candidate for mystery shopping um, because your culture may not be ready for this level of information. In fact, you know, the truth of it is we've had situations where I have actually witnessed leaders say, you know, want to deny and argue and say well don't tell people don't tell my staff this don't say that you may not really be ready for the level of information that's unearthed in mystery shopping and I know Andy you had a story about this as well right I did and it was a fascinating one because in one of the healthcare clients we had when the phone was really not answered the uh, CEO said, I can't focus on that. We have to reduce our length of stay at six days. Now, I, I really wasn't going to judge which was more important, but clearly the experience as well as your length of stay create an entire experience. And that makes up whether or not you're a place of value that I should return to. From a branding perspective, it was very disturbing. So thanks for the moment. Yeah, and I find that a burning platform, I mean, the mystery shopping moves information from the head to the heart, and nothing creates a burning platform better than those stories. I found that when I was, you know, uh, working as a VP of business development and marketing for an organization, I would play um, managers the recordings of the voices of, of the people in the focus groups. And there were times where their stories would move those managers to tears. You know, and it, it, it does create that burning platform, but I don't want you to lose sight of the fact that one of the things I really love is mystery shopping exposes your star performers. There have been so many times where we've done studies and we've been able to say, look at the calls that came in that were answered by Michelle. Michelle is scoring on an average of 98% with her scores with the interactions with callers. Now, what can we learn from the way she does things? Could we 
help have her help train the other people. So there's really opportunities to identify the star performer, star performers, but also of course those coaching opportunities. So I want to just put in a, a, a word here too that we are finishing up a white paper that will be released in the next couple of weeks. For anybody out there listening who is interested in that white paper, please just log into info at baird-group.com and we would be happy to send you a copy of the Mystery Shopping White Paper. So Andy, go ahead and take it away. Well, stay on with me here, Chris, because we had asked in advance for questions from the field. And knowing the mix of people who are on here, I thought that I would put some of these up we have enough time and ask Chris to address them because in our preparation for this, they have very interesting additional insights to her talk today. So the first one is, should we tell our staff that we're doing mystery shops? Chris? You know, that's a good question and it's one that comes up very often, so I'm glad it's here. Um, <coughs> we err on the side of transparency. Our work is all about improving culture, not only for patients, but the people who serve them. And trust is as important in your work culture as it is for your patient experience. So we say our advice to our clients, and it's always up to them how they want to handle it, but our advice is that they should go ahead and tell that tell the staff, tell the providers that they are going to be doing mystery shopping. What usually happens is people think that they've spotted them all there's a little bit of scuttle about it for a little bit and they, they're pretty darn sure they've spotted every one of the mystery shoppers at about the time we're ready to start. So it's, it's transparent and I, I like for them to position it in context of quality assurance. Nobody would argue that you'd be monitoring quality assurance for, for safety, things like hand washing. So it just helps get the culture acclimated to that as an element of, of quality assurance as well. I'd like to take on the next one because we have a lot of nurses and uh, nurses who are in nursing school on today. There are many changes I'd like to see at my hospital, but I'm just a nurse. How do I get someone in management to agree to bringing in mystery shoppers? This is a really interesting challenge or opportunity because it means you're going to put a mirror up and begin to see yourself with fresh eyes. Remember, that's where I began. And so rather than simply assume we know how we're doing, they become part of your partner in creating a far better healthcare experience. And if you begin to position it that way, management may see you as a leader in trying to enhance your patient's experience. But it also leads to implementation. So I'll turn the next question over to Chris. We had a mystery shopper come in. We had mystery shoppers come in, but hospital leadership isn't implementing any of the recommendations. So it's one thing to see yourself, but what do we do about that? Chris? I think, you know, to come back and talk with leaders about it, saying, I I'm concerned because we discovered this problem. I don't want to ignore it, I, you know, bring it back to the leadership. But sometimes we can be impactful in our own area of influence. So. For instance, let's say this is your nursing unit and you and one of the things that you noticed was a problem with noise. There is no harm. In fact, I highly encourage people to tackle problems at the, the where the challenge occurs. So if it's noise on your unit, that's where the problem needs to be resolved. So get involved. Ask your manager directly if you could, you know, spearhead a team to manage the problem at least on your own unit. Bring the findings and the results back to your leaders so that maybe you can be the model for a best practice. But I, Andy, if you don't mind, I'm gonna I'm gonna go backwards a little bit. Of and course. I just want to comment um, to the previous question: Who said I'm just a nurse? Um, <laughs> As a former RN, a current RN. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, RN, <laughs> and I just I, I want to encourage. Whoever wrote that, and there may be many of us out there who might say I'm just a nurse, but I want you to think about what that says. You're not just a nurse. You are a champion of the patient experience. 
and nobody's going to impact the patient experience more than a nurse. So I just had to comment on that. <laughs> um, we have a number of uh, C-suite executives who have joined us today, and I thought this was an excellent question because it does start from the top down, but this question was, how do I get my staff, leadership, and rank and file to change their old ways of doing things and put into practice the mystery shopper's findings? We can jointly do this. Chris, why don't you start, and then I'll add in my thoughts here. Yeah, I think, first of all, engaging the heart is just absolutely essential. So when you have the findings, bringing it forward to the staff, not in a punitive fashion, but as an opportunity, reminding them that here's the story that we've just been told. How can we write that, rewrite the experience? What do we want our patients to say? What's the gap between what we want them to say and what they just shared with us? Let's look at that gap and try to close it. So engaging them on the front lines and, and also trying to engage the heart first and foremost. My thoughts here from a leadership perspective is that you have to actually walk the walk and not just ask others to make this happen. In a sense, you're taking the undesirable and making it desirable. And as a leader, there are three things we often talk about. Do they have the skills to do it? Do you have a structure in your organization to enable them to do it. I love the one about scanning instead of doing rounds. That was a misread altogether. And then how do you begin to create the mentoring and not the, the management, but the mentoring to reward those who are doing it and demonstrate that it works. And so this is about culture and organizational change at the very basics. So you're on to something important, but you're going to have to lead it. And it's not going to happen in a moment. It's a journey. The last one, we've implemented all the changes the mystery shoppers recommended. What's the best way to communicate this to the consumer, the patient, the physicians? Chris, I'll let you start there. Yeah, I think that it's important for, for you to communicate very regularly that, you know, our patients spoke, we listened, and here's what we did. I mean, that's the simplest down and dirty message. But I think it's important for people to be engaged in that. So not only tell them what was implemented, but make sure that you tell them why and share those stories with them. You know, when people see you taking action, it, it really spells out to them that you see the patient experience as a priority and that you took the time and energy and resources to actually conduct mystery shopping and now are taking it seriously enough to want to make some change. From a communications point of view, and, and I'm not saying advertising, but communications, remember we started by saying it's not what you say, it's what people say about you. And whether this is social media or it's blogs or it's patients telling stories to others or, or it's uh, how your videos operate today or it's what you're advertising, you can't have sizzle without a steak. And so what you're promising, you have to now perform, and it's in the everyday experience that it's happening. So those residents that I mentioned at the beginning, don't walk past a patient and, and ignore them, but in fact, greet them and, and make sure they know where they're going. So all of this is about behavior modification and cultural and values and making it happen. So I'm looking at the time and let me wrap up and uh, thank you all for joining us, but let me give you some final thoughts you have to remember that the brain hates change. Both Chris and I will tell you that while the part of the brain that understands this intellectually will agree with you, there's a part that is emotional and wants to reject it. And so nobody's standing there waiting to have a mirror to show them how they're actually doing. I don't quite know why in healthcare it's like this, but they should think of it as a hotel or a great experience and how to make it happen. Change is happening. There are organizations who are really doing this. Their HCAP scores are extraordinary. The Cleveland Clinic realized that its HCAP scores weren't good and transformed itself, often with anthropologists, to create a whole new experience there and raise the patient's experience. So some of the things to remember, if you're going to change, have a crisis or create one. Try not to have a crisis, but try and create the energy that comes from that so people's brains pay attention. It's not personal. Storytelling. The way the brain operates, it takes the facts and it creates a story. You're trying to make the story up, 
Let the he team tell you a story about what it's going to be like when it works really well, and you will see them all begin to live it. Make the undesirable desirable. This isn't about vision as much as we'd like it. It's about taking what people clearly think is easy and simple and telling them that it's not acceptable anymore. And rather than hit you on the wrist, we're going to help you fix it really well. I actually was um, doing shadowing in one hospital client I had, and only 40% of the doctors washed their hands. And one of the patient's family members said, you didn't wash your hands. Don't touch my father. I mean, this is uh, doctors not washing their hands. Very interesting. It's a journey. It's both behavior and culture. It's values, beliefs, and habits. And it doesn't happen because I say so. It happens because we are part of a whole new experience. The brain needs focus and density. You can't do it once in a while. You have to do it all the time. Small wins, you'll never do it if you're trying to turn the battleship with an oar. You got to keep stroking a little at a time. And I found this and I think it captures it really well because the way the brain works is if you believe it, you will see it. And I love this one. If you believe it, you will succeed in doing it. So a pitch for our next webinar, hopefully without technical errors, will be Friday, October 24th. It will be all about what's happening in inbound marketing and the power of online marketing. I want to thank Chris. Chris, you did a marvelous job. I, I'd like you to say a, a final thoughts for our attendees. All of you stayed on. I can't thank you much for doing so. Um, Chris, please. Yeah, thanks, Andy. It's been a pleasure to, to work with you on this. And just circling back, you know, when you said create a crisis, well, that's the same as the burning platform that I talked about. So, you know, the Baird Group exists for one reason, and that's to improve health care for patients and for the people who serve them. So I encourage anybody who's listening out there to, you know, just do the best you can to raise the bar on service excellence. Thank you again for joining our webinar series. You can see them all on our website or on YouTube. I give you the information here. Both of us are open to chat more. And if you'd like to chat, just send us an email and we'll set up a time to do it. Thank you again, Chris. And I appreciate you all for joining us. Bye now. Bye-bye.